All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll begin our session shortly here. Again, if we are disconnected for more than 10 minutes or so, uh, please check on your Canvas site a little bit later for the information that we would have covered during this particular live session. So let's go ahead and start with our attendance check-in real quickly here. Uh, at this time, please type present for your attendance in chat. If you did not sign in with your full name, be sure to include it in the message. Good, I'll try to remind people a little bit later uh, as others may show up as we start this presentation. Okay, uh, by most of my clocks here, I have the time is 1.15. So let's go ahead and begin our presentation. And as we've done so far this semester, we'll start off with a quick review of our last session. All right, so during our last session, uh, we focused on the structure of the neuron. And we can talk about the neuron structure as we talk about how uh, communication works with the neuron as well. So it starts off with that dendrite, okay, that looks like a tree branches. And the tr dendrites receive information. And this causes an action potential or neural impulse to occur that travels through the cell body in the axon. And some of these axons may be covered with a myelin sheath. And this myelin sheath, as you recall, speeds up the transmission. So some, some axons will require speedy transmission of the, the message and they become myelin sheath because of that. And again, we also noted that sometimes the body has a, a glitch and it will attack itself. And the name of the disease that attacks the myelin sheath and degenerates it is called multiple sclerosis. Then we see it travel, this neural impulse travels down the axon and it reaches eventually the terminal branches of the axon, which contain these vesicles with neurotransmitters. Now, when the neural impulse reaches there, the neurotransmitters are gonna be released and they're released into this synaptic gap. Remember, we have these billions and billions of neurons, but they never actually really touch. They're always surrounded by this little space called the synapse or the synaptic gap and the neurotransmitters are required to be able to transverse this gap so that it can land on the dendrite of an adjacent neuron. Now, we describe this process as an electrochemical one. The electro part is the action potential or the neural impulse traveling down the body of the axon. And the chemical part is when that neurotransmitter is released to go across that gap to have an impact on the adjacent neurons. Now, once the process is concluding, that's when we see reuptake. Uh, the reuptake process occurs uh, by the neuron, the axon of the neuron that released the neurotransmitter. It simply reabsorbs that neurotransmitter uh, back into itself. We also pointed out that time too about such drugs as SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, and those drugs are usually used to uh, help people combat bouts with depression. Because what they discovered, if you have more serotonin active for longer periods of time in your brain, you tend to be less depressed. All right, then we talked about the nervous system. The nervous system is made up of two primary parts, the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, plus the peripheral nervous system, everything outside of that brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is also divided up into the autonomic, non-voluntary and the somatic voluntary. The autonomic system are going to be things that we don't have direct voluntary control over. Okay, the, the heart, for example, those types of things. And then the somatic voluntary is that when we clap our hands or control our body parts, that's voluntary. And so that is part of under the PNS as well. Furthermore, we have the autonomic nervous system can be divided up into two other subsystems, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic is what happens when we are in a very stressful situation. We are afraid for our life, for example, and then we will have that flight or fight response. Our body's prepared to either fight it off or run away. And then when we need to calm things down, the parasympathetic system does the opposite of what the sympathetic system did. Uh, 
The sympathetic system revs us up so we're ready to run or to fight. And then basically the parasympathetic, it revs us down or brings us down, downgrades it so that we're not ready for fighting anymore. We are in a state of calm. Then we looked at the other type of system in this particular chapter, the endocrine system. Uh, compared to the nervous system, the endocrine system is much slower, okay, but it is vital of vital importance. The endocrine system is made up of glands throughout the body, and they produce hormones, and these hormones are released through the bloodstream that will impact other glands and other body parts and the body and brain together. And we emphasize the point that the nervous system and the endocrine system, they do influence each other, like a cycle. Then we looked at monitoring activities of the brain. We focused primarily on non-invasive techniques, techniques such as MRIs, fMRIs, PET scans, that allow us to be able to see what's actually going on in the brain and try to associate those images and that data with what we're actually doing. For example, what tasks we're uh, working on or what we're thinking about. And then finally, we wound up by looking at some new approaches, new approaches that are being employed recently, such as neuromarketing, where they're looking at how marketing uh, aspects can have an impact on the brain itself. How does it actually influence the brain? So we can image things going on in the brain as we are experiencing certain types of marketing stimuli. So those are some of the key items that we covered in the last session. So now we pick up things where we left off, and that was our preparation to talk about the brain. And we started this conversation off with the old brain. So the brain, less complex brain structures. Our tour of the brain begins with parts of the human brain found also in simpler animals. These parts generally deal with less complex functions. We have the brainstem, the thalamus, the reticular formation, the cerebellum, and the limbic system. And so we'll spend some time looking at each one of these. Okay, so we have the brainstem, the oldest and innermost region of the brain. It begins where the spinal cord swells as it enters the skull. The brain stem is responsible for automatic survival functions. And what we mean by automatic survival functions, these are things that take care of themselves. We don't have to control them. They just are automatic to us. Then we have the medulla at the base of the brain stem. It controls such things as heartbeat and breathing. Also, and I'll note this several times during this presentation, the brain stem is a crossover point where most nerves to and from each side of the brain connect with the body's opposite side. So here we see the brain stem focusing on the pons and the medulla. Again, the brain's innermost region it begins where the spinal cord enters the skull. Now, this stuff is of great importance to our survival. The medulla controls the most basic functions such as heartbeat and breathing. Someone with total brain damage above the medulla could still breathe independently, but someone with damage to this area could not. Now, I'm sure we've seen plenty of movies and TV shows where people are always in fist fights and knocking people on the head. Uh, if it was that easy, okay, uh, if there was no damage. Well, we'd see how it is on television, but a, a whack to the head can be particularly dangerous, particularly it depends on where that whack falls. Does it fall somewhere of vital importance to the organism? So someone who has brain damage, uh, at this particular area are going to be in a load of trouble. Now, one person who did uh, have this unfortunately happen to them is the actor Christopher Reeve. Uh, he was famous for playing the role of Superman in the 70s, mid and late 70s, I believe. And he did have a stint in Smallville, another 
show about Superman of all things. Uh, but after he had an accident jumping, he, he was an equestrian and he uh, did steeple jumps uh, on horses and he fell off and he unfortunately broke his back at the, uh, broke his spine at the level of the medulla. After that accident, he could no longer breathe on his own for the rest of his life. He had to be confined to a wheelchair and have a machine attached to it so that it will help him in breathing. So the idea is that damage to these parts are oftentimes life-threatening. Then we have the thalamus. The thalamus is called and has been called the sensory switchboard or the router. All sensory messages except smell are routed through the thalamus on the way to the cortex. So what we have is a situation, and we'll see this a little bit later in a, a future chapter when we talk about sensation and perception. We have a variety of sensory organs out there. And for example, let's talk about the eyes. The sensory receptors in the eyeballs will pick up electromagnetic waves out there, light, and then they will turn them into something that we can use to a, a neural impulse that we can use. It will then go to the thalamus and the thalamus then has to send this information to the right part of the brain so that we can actually know what it is that we're seeing. All right. So it sends it to the cortex so that it can then be processed. Now it should be noted that there can be damage to the thalamus. Damage to the thalamus can cause blindness even though the sensory organs are gonna be just fine. The eyeball, the optic nerve, and everything is just fine when it comes to your ability to see. But unfortunately, the information about the visual information around you is being prevented from going to the part of the brain to process that visual information because of this damage to the thalamus, okay? But again, damage to the thalamus would not have any impact on our sense of smell because that doesn't process smell. The thalamus does not process smell there. It goes a totally different route. And again, I told you we'd see this again. This is the crossover graph that I wanted to make sure you saw. These messages cross over from one side of the body to the opposite side of the brain. So again, at this level, what we're seeing, the crossover. So the right brain controls the left body. The left brain controls uh, the right body. The other structure that we want to look at is called the recticular or net-like formation. The recticular formation is a nerve network in the brainstem. And we can see them sort of indicated here. All right, so nerve network here. Now, what this does is that it enables alertness or arousal. And usually when we see the term arousal, we're talking about alertness. Okay, your state of being very alert or not alert at all. So your level of arousal. Okay, so it enables our alertness. Stimulating this makes us wide awake. All right, so that's what this reticular formation is doing. Now, the other thing that it's very good at is that it filters incoming sensory information and relays it to other brain areas. Okay, basically it controls selective awareness. It selects which incoming information to send to other brain areas for processing. So this is what allows us to follow a conversation in a crowd, okay? With a lot of stuff coming around you, a lot of noises, and then you can focus and listen to what's going on between two people in front of you. You filter out the other stuff. Now, there's another aspect of this, too, that I usually bring up, and I'll do it here. Uh, if you've ever been at a party and you're having a, a really in-depth conversation with somebody uh, near a wall as the party's going on around you, there's music, there's people talking, uh, there's the sound of glasses and things of that nature. And then all of a sudden, as you're talking with this person, you hear your name mentioned across the room. Okay. Now, the key thing here is that what this sort of indicates is that you were getting all this information in, but it wasn't until the information became pertinent to you that you were made aware of it. 
okay? So then this is what the reticular formation is doing. It filters incoming sensory information and relays it to other brain areas. It selects. And one of the things that we're used to being uh, very attentive to, by the way, aroused with or alert to is gonna be the sound of our name. All right, I'm gonna pause there to see if there are any questions or comments and anyone who did join us uh, and did not get a chance to uh, state that they are attending the session, please do so now by just typing present. And if your name is not associated with your login, please make sure your name is listed there. All right, I'll pause for a bit. The reticular formation is gonna be considered its own thing, okay? So it has its own purpose, its own thing. It's gonna be located definitely close to some of these structures, but the reticular formation, its purpose is maintaining a certain state of alertness and arousal so that we uh, can control what is happening around us. For example, we get information in, Okay, uh, and sometimes information may be, may be very, very important for us to respond in a certain way. We'll talk more about that basic idea as we go through some additional chapters. Okay, so next we look at the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum, also referred to as the little brain, the cerebellum helps coordinate voluntary movement, such as playing a sport, kicking a ball, shooting a basketball, hitting a baseball, all that type of activity requires you to have some coordinated movement. And this is what the cerebellum does. It helps us to coordinate our movement, all right? So the cerebellum also has other functions too, it helps many other functions, including enabling nonverbal learning and memory. And we'll talk a little bit more about nonverbal learning uh, when we get to the chapter on learning about what type of learning seems to be associated with the cerebellum. And again, interestingly enough, we can learn things and not even be aware that we have learned them. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Now, another note here about the cerebellum. When a police officer or a law enforcement officer pulls somebody over for a sobriety test, the touch your nose or walk a straight line or recite the alphabet backwards type of thing, what that officer is truly doing is trying to test the functionality of your cerebellum. Because when we consume some sort of drug like alcohol, for example, we can easily see it because it has an impact and influences the operation of our cerebellum. So when you're told to extend your arms and with your index finger, touch your nose, when you are clean sober, you usually would have no problem doing that. But now your coordinated movement is being interfered with because you have sort of taken your ability down a peg or two by drinking the alcohol, you may miss your nose or fail to walk that straight line. So that is what they're actually doing, testing the functioning of your cerebellum. Now, this next structure is the limbic or border system, okay? The limbic system coordinates emotions such as fear and aggression, basic drives such as hunger and sex, and the formation of episodic memories. Some of these terms may not be very, may, might not be familiar with them yet. And we'll talk more about them a little bit later, but episodic memories are gonna be memories of your personal life. For example, the last party you went to. If you can remember that last party you went to, that's almost like a TV episode of your personal life show, okay? And that's what they're saying. It helps in the formation of these episodic memories. So let's look at the specific portions of this limbic system that are involved in these types of things. First, we have the hippocampus, known as the seahorse. It processes conscious episodic memories, okay? So things that you're aware of, and that's one of the key things, that's why they have to be conscious, you have awareness of them, 
and you can remember the last time you were at a party or remember your high school graduation. All right. It also works with the amygdala, which we'll see in a second, to form emotionally charged memory. So if something is very powerful and emotional to you, then the memory will not only be stored, it will be stored associated with the emotion tied to it as well. Let me bring up another thing real quickly here, since I did mention it previously. We talked about the thalamus being the router or the switchboard center for all our sensory system, all except for smell. The key thing here is that smell is routed through the limbic system, okay? And because of that, there are some very unique qualities that can happen when you smell something. Okay, for example, if you have somebody that you are uh, mad, crazy in love with, and they've been your partner for years and years and years, and now they're going on a long extended trip, uh, you may keep a shirt of theirs because it has their, their cologne or their perfume on it, what have you, as well as their scent. Okay, and what happens is when you smell it, what will happen is you will have a flood of memories because the memories are going to be coming because of the hippocampus. So the memories are very rich and vivid, but also the memories will be charged with emotion. And the reason it's charged with emotion too is because of the other structure located in this limbic system. And that is the amygdala, sort of shaped like an almond. It consists of these two llama bean sized neural clusters, and they help process emotions, especially fear and aggression. And it's because of this route that smell takes through this system that the sense of smell does have those emotional evoking and memory invoking types of capabilities. Now, you can note over here, as we point out the, the amygdala and the hippocampus and the hypothalamus up here, uh, I just want to point out the pituitary gland is not part of this limbic system that we're talking about here. It's just there for, for reference. Now, let's look at the amygdala, okay? And this is enabling two different responses to a threat. And I, I'm a cat person, we have plenty of them here, but the idea, don't like or appreciate got frowny faces to what they would do to cats in these experiments. So electrical stimulation of one of the areas of a cat's amygdala would provoke a very aggressive reaction like we see here. When a cat does this, they are being very aggressive. They're probably, uh, ready to fight what's happening here is they're puffing themselves up so they can look more terrifying. They're showing their teeth, their fangs, so they can say, hey, I'm a dangerous cat, all right? And that's what we see. But if you stimulate another area, a different part of the amygdala, and put the cat in a cage with a mouse, the cat will cower in terror. It'll be terrified of that little mouse, okay? So what we see here are parts of the brain of our old brain here that are responsible for some very important functions and, and displays of behavior and how we process things. Now let's talk about the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus lies below the thalamus, ergo hypo. It regulates body temperature and ensures adequate food and water intake so we have a balance so we're not underfed or overfed, all right, homeostasis, and is involved in sex drive. Now, I'll, I'll always relate this when I remember it, but I remember one of my first classes in psychology, I think my very first psychology class, I remember the textbook had a picture of two rats. One was really, really skinny, uh, very emaciated look like, and the other one was very huge, you know, really, really huge. And basically what they described was what the researchers had done to their hypothalamus. So if your lesion, again, a lesion would be like destroy, if you destroy one part of a rat's hypothalamus, okay, what that rat will do is just stop eating. They won't eat again. There's no drive for them to take any, any food in, okay? Now, if you stimulate or lesion, destroy another part of the hypothalamus, the opposite happens. All that rat wants to do is eat, eat, eat until they will get so 
obese and large that their health is going to be at danger and they may die too, very much like their colleague who had the other part of the hypothalamus stimulated. So again, we see the structures have some vital life-giving, life life-sustaining roles. And not only uh, for animals, but the same thing can apply to us as well. Also, the hypothalamus directs the endocrine system via messages to, again, the master gland, the pituitary gland. Okay, so what we are looking at here in this graph, we see that there is the electrified grid at the bottom of this rat's cage. And then there's also an electrode going into the rat's brain, specifically their hypothalamus. And then at the far left within this cage, we see there's a stimulation pedal. And the idea is if you press the stimulation pedal, you'll get stimulation to one's hypothalamus. Here we're seeing the hypothalamus as a reward center. Okay, so basically what happens is this. Why did the rat cross the grid? Well, they'll do that if the reward is great enough. So why did the rat want to get to the other side? Pushing the pedal that stimulated the electrode placed in the hypothalamus was much more rewarding than food pellets. So what we see is that this reward centers that we have located in various parts of our, in our brain, and the hypothalamus is one of them, We'll do things that may be deleterious to our health, our long-term survivability, because we sort of get addicted to the pleasure, okay? And we see this demonstrated rather easily uh, with rats here, because they will press that stimulation pedal, because the stimulation they get from the hypothalamus is so rewarding, more so than life-sustaining food. I'll pause to see if there are any questions or comments at this time. Okay, it looks like we're good. All right, so that takes care of the, the older structures of the brain. And sometimes you may hear somebody refer to their lizard brain. That's just a term that we hear sometimes slang term talk about brains that are very, the, the simple part of our brain that sometimes we can get a feeling like someone's looking at us, okay, feeling of unease, okay. What that may mean is simply that one of our older brain structures is picking up on something and we may not be aware of it. And we'll talk more about that in the next chapter, I believe, when we look at consciousness because sometimes uh, things are going on with our body and our environment, and we may not be consciously aware of them. Okay, so next we talk about the, just the summary of some of the things that we've covered here so far, a review of brain structures. We've talked about most of them. We've talked about the hypothalamus controlling maintenance functions such as eating, helps govern the endocrine system. We've talked about the reticular formation with control of arousal, the medulla controlling heartbeat and breathing, the amygdala over here linked to emotion, the hippocampus linked to memory, and we will talk more about these a little bit later as well. And then the spinal cord, part of the central nervous system, and the cerebellum, the little brain that helps coordinate with voluntary movement and balance. So we've talked a great deal about the brain stem and the limbic system. What we haven't really talked about much is the corpus callosum and the cerebral cortex, which we will be talking about real soon here as we get to our discussion of the new brain. So with that summary and lead in, uh, we look at the cerebral cortex structure, the lobes, the motor and sensory strips and association areas, brain plasticity, and the function of the right and left hemispheres from cases of the divided and intact brain. So this all covers the new brain, the cerebral cortex, four lobes, two hemispheres, and the association area. So let's go ahead and start with that. So what we have here is the cerebral cortex. All right, the orange area down here is the cerebellum that we just got through talking about. And what we see is this outer gray bark structure that is wrinkled 
in order to create more surface area for some 20 plus billion neurons is what we refer to as the brain. It is organized into four lobes, frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, and each of two hemispheres. These are the two hemispheres. Okay, and it is connected by this thing called the corpus callosum, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Now, why is our brain, this new brain of ours, so wrinkly? Well, it comes down to what they say here, surface area. If our brain was smooth, that would mean that we'd have to have a larger skull, a larger head. And if we had a larger head, we'd have to have larger neck muscles. If we had larger neck muscles, we'd have to have larger shoulders. So as opposed to doing that, uh, it just evolved into becoming wrinkled. So we did not have that size constraint. Okay, so it did not increase our overall size. So the wrinkly part allows for more surface area uh, in our relatively small heads so that we do not have to increase our body size drastically. Okay, so let's look at the lobes of the cerebral cortex a little bit more closely here. Uh, we have the frontal lobes, okay, involved in speaking and muscle movements and in making plans and judgments. The parietal lobes, including the sensory cortex. The occipital lobes, including the visual areas, they receive visual information from the opposite visual field, meaning when you see something in your right visual field, it's being processed in the left occipital lobes and, and, such, and such things as that. Then we have the temporal lobes, including the auditory processing areas. So what we see here are lobes that tend to have certain functionalities for them, places where they get certain types of things done. Now, these outline the functions of the brain, the motor and the sensory strips, okay? So now let me explain to you what we're seeing here with all the large face and lips and jaw and all this type of stuff. What is, what is basically communicating to you? So body parts along each strip represent the amount of neural space devoted to movement or sensation of that body part. So things that are a little bit larger, okay, what they're basically saying is that there's more neural space being devoted to that particular body part, meaning that they're probably a little bit more sensitive. So they re require more neural space in order to process sensory input coming in into the somatosensory cortex that we see on the right side here, or information or instructions going out as we see in the motor cortex on the left side. So these strips are located at the border of the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. And so it just identifies the places where our sensory input, like when we touch something, where it goes to get processed. And when we get instructions sent out, where does it come from? All right, so sensory functions of the cortex. So we have the sensory strip deals with information from, for example, touch stimuli. The occipital lobe deals with visual information. And the auditory information is sent to the temporal lobe for processing. Now, let me make a point here. Note that when someone in a psychotic state is experiencing voices or auditory hallucinations, okay? Meaning that they are hearing voices. No one else around them are hearing the voices because the voices are not really there. But what they have been able to demonstrate that when someone going through a psychotic state is experiencing voices or auditory hallucinations, their auditory cortex is active. So as far as that person's concerned, their brain is actually processing voices that no one else can hear. Sounds kind of frightening, but that's part of the whole idea of some of the psychotic episodes that people do go through. So as far as they're concerned, they're not pretending. Their brain is actually telling them that there are voices there and they're saying things. And we'll talk more about that in the later part of the semester when we get to certain chapters. 
Now let's talk about association areas. Now I'm sure all of you have heard the following and, and, and on your chat, tell me if you've heard of it or not. So yes, you've heard or no, you haven't heard about this. Uh, you might have heard that we only use about 10% of our brain. Excuse me. So it does seem like most people are still hearing that, that 10% of the brain thing. And basically what it comes down to is probably a misunderstanding of a few basic ideas. And I'll highlight some of these as we go, but let's go ahead and start. So the association function of the cortex. More complex animals have more cortical space devoted to integrating and associating information. Okay, now let's look at the rat, cat, chimpanzee, and the human. So we can see with the red are the motor areas. The yellow gold is the sensory areas. And then we have sort of a pink there, sort of the association areas. All right, the relative portion of the cortex devoted to taking in sensory information and sending out motor commands is smaller as the association areas are larger. So as associate, association areas grow, then we have less cortex being utilized for sensory information and for motor commands, okay? And that's what we tend to see a little bit more easily in the chimpanzee and the human examples, all right? So basically what we see with the rat and the cat there are motor and sensory areas and very little association areas. Okay, and we'll see the importance of that a little bit later. All right, so. So together, the small cortical areas that either receive sensory input or direct muscular output occupy about one fourth of the human's brain's thin wrinkled cover. The remaining vast regions of the cortex are association areas. So think of it this way. Back in the day, as we were learning initially about the brain, we were only able to identify certain small areas that seemed to be doing anything, okay? Seem to be controlling anything or processing something out in the world. So it sort of gave us a, a miss understanding of what we were using. So if we we're only using these small bits of the brain to do all this stuff here, then the other area of the brain, these association areas that we call them now, were not being utilized. So therefore the belief was that we're not optimizing our brain use. We're only utilizing a small percentage of our brain capacity. That's uh, incorrect because the association areas are very important actually. So the association areas are found in all four lobes, the prefrontal cortex and the forward part of the frontal lobes enable judgment, planning, and processing of new memories. And when we have damage to these association areas, they result in different types of losses. We can't always say if something happens, there's some sort of damage to an association area, there's not one way or one systematic way that it always reveals itself in behavior or some sort of deficit. The key thing is this, the association areas, the neurons are busy with higher mental functions. That's what it comes down to. We see higher mental functions occurring with all these undifferentiated space, these association areas. That's why we are smarter and at the top of the food chain because of our more vast association areas that allow us to do a lot more integrating and associating of information that led to us to be able to plan, to plot, to scheme. Whereas other animals, they're much more still instinctual because they do not have these vast association areas that make them uh, able to access higher mental functions. The association areas basically are lead to many of the tasks that help to identify us as being and making us human. So the association areas are very, very important. They are very critical to us being 
what we have become today, good or bad, uh, we have been able to use those association areas to our great benefit. So, and normally what happens is when you're working on a task, uh, the key areas do light up, but as you're processing things, other areas of the brain are getting involved too, these association areas, because they're aiding you in your planning, your strategizing, your, your coming up with logical rationales and creative ideas, those things, okay? All right, so now uh, to look a little bit closer at this case, let's look from a blast from the past. I do believe we mentioned him in the first chapter and this is Phineas Gage. Uh, just to give you a background again, in a work accident, a metal rod shot up through Phineas Gage's skull, destroying his eye and part of his frontal lobes. After healing, he was considered to be much more rude, odd, and irritable and unpredictable than he was before. Now, the possible explanation for this is for this change in personality. And again, a personality, let's give you a really brief definition, is a consistent way, it's the way somebody thinks, feels, and behaves across a variety of situations, for example. So basically the idea as to why this change in him occurred was damage to his frontal lobes. It hurt his ability to inhibit emotions and impulses. And that brings up another thing. Uh, now, some of you may be teenagers, uh, some of you may not be. Uh, so it may be kind of odd for you to respond to it if you are still a teenager. But do teenagers, are their brains different than an adult's brain? Let's say an adult being someone 40, 50 years old. Just tell me if they're different, different or not different. Just tell me in chat. Okay, and, and basically I'm getting some responses that yes, they're different. Uh, and what we see when it comes to the teenage brain, uh, parts of our brain do not fully mature until usually we get into our 20s or so. Particularly the frontal lobe where we have uh, more inhibition control. So when we see someone and they're in their teens, they are gonna be more impulsive by nature because their brain has not fully formed yet, particularly the frontal lobes where we have more inhibitory control. Uh, and as you get older, you gain more frontal lobe, it, it matures more, and then you're gonna be a lot less impulsive. You'll have a lot, a lot more in, inhibitions, okay? And that's what we normally see, okay? So that's one of the differences that we see between the young uh, and older folks. And it's one of the reasons, by the way, <clears throat> because of the, excuse me, please. Because of the teenage brain, that sometimes when they commit crimes, they may not be held fully accountable or not get the full extent of the punitive law thrown at them because of that. Because they are, by their nature, more impulsive. Okay. So there's one other thing I want to tell you about. Uh, about the Phineas Gaze thing. Uh, it may be in one of the videos that you you, you observed recently, uh, but it's the brain in the teacup thing. I'll, I'll probably will massacre it, but the idea here is that shortly after the accident, uh, they did go fetch a doctor for Phineas, uh, and the doctor was having a hard time believing what they were describing happened to him, uh, that the rod you know, went through his head and, and impelled him and all this type of stuff. And the story goes that he was being offered some tea or drinking some tea and the doctor still didn't believe it until he coughed and a little bit of his brain fell out into the cup. Well, that's the way the story goes anyway. So basically we see here that Phineas Gage's skull was kept uh, as a medical record. Using measurements and modern neuroimaging techniques, researchers have reconstructed the probable path of the rod through Gage's brain. The photograph we hear is more recent. This is a recently discovered photo. It shows Gage after his accident. Uh, and here, this image has been reversed to show the features correctly. Uh, you may not be aware of this. I wasn't until long, a while back. Early photos, including this one, were usually going to be mirror images. So it would reverse things. And so here they just reverse it so it looks normal, all right? So that leads us uh, away from the idea of uh, certain aspects of the brain to talk about certain other aspects of the brain. And one of, it is, one of them is going to be brain plasticity. All right, 
plasticity, the brain is adaptable. If the brain is damaged, especially in general association areas of the cortex, the brain does not repair damaged neurons, but it can restore some functions. It can form new connections, reorganize, reassign brain areas to new functions. Plasticity is the brain's ability to change, especially during childhood. So if you have some sort of traumatic brain event, God forbid it happens, but if it does happen, having, having it happen earlier will probably allow a greater opportunity for some of the damage to be lessened and some of the challenges that may result to be overcome. Now, some, some neurogenesis, the creation of new brain cells, helps rebuild as possible uh, as well. We do see that neurogenesis does occur. Now, this particular video that I think was included in your canvas this, this term uh, shows the story. I think her name was Jody in the video. Uh, when she was around three years of age, she started having these very powerful seizures that were basically debilitating her and were threatening her life. And so they made a drastic decision to do something about that to try to save her life and, and the quality of her life to be improved. And they removed an entire hemisphere of her brain. So this six-year-old had a hemispherectomy to end life-threatening seizures. Her remaining hemisphere compensated for the damage. The way it goes is uh, only a week or two after the surgery was done, uh, she walked out of the hospital. Okay, so despite list of lateralized functions and what they mean is this, we've learned over the years of research that certain functions uh, of the brain seem to be lateralized. That means seen in one hemisphere and not necessarily in the other. But despite lists of lateralized functions, there are many areas of overlap and duplication in the hemispheres. This part of the, re that is part of the reason uh, that this girl with only one hemisphere was able to adapt. So one could imagine that when half her brain, her hemisphere was removed, the remaining one started to figure out workarounds, started to make new connections, to reorganize, to reassign brain areas to new function, demonstrating the plasticity, the plastic nature uh, of the brain. I'll pause there to see if there are any questions or comments on that. Okay, moving on then. So that then takes us to the other item uh, that I wanted to make sure that we covered. And I think this is also, I believe, a, a topic for one of your discussion assignments. We we're talking about the split brain. So split brain. Now what happens and why split brain? Well, seizures. And what is a seizure? You may have heard of epileptic seizures before. A seizure is when you have uncontrolled, uncoordinated firing of neurons, like a, a storm of firing of neurons in the brain that causes disruption of higher mental functions. So when someone is going through a seizure, they, their eyes may roll up into their skull. They may get a dazed look like they're not there anymore because all of a sudden their higher mental functions have been disrupted because of this storm in their brain. Now, the issue is this, is that when you have a storm in your, your brain, let's say it starts in one hemisphere, well, it can travel to the other hemisphere too because brains are connected at the corpus callosum. And that's what we're seeing here. The corpus callosum is demonstrated here. So to end severe whole brain seizures, some people have had surgery to cut the corpus callosum. Again, that is a band of axons connecting the hemispheres. Now, the key thing that you need to understand is this. This is the only place where your left brain and your right brain communicate. Otherwise, they would be independent of each other. So with some people, because of this seizure situation, they've had their corpus callosum severed. And the researchers have studied the impact of this surgery 
on patients functioning. So separating the hemispheres. Each hemisphere controls the opposite side of the body. We've seen that a couple of times discussed already today and is aware of the visual field of that opposite side. We've talked about that a couple of times today. All right. So again, as I've stated several times, if something shows up in your right visual field, it is your left occipital that's processing it. If it shows up in your left visual field, it is your right occipital that's processing it. Now the information is going to be shared with one hemisphere to another when you have that corpus callosum intact. Without the corpus callosum, the halves of the body and the halves of the visual field do not, do not work together. So only the left half of the brain has enough verbal ability to express its thoughts out loud. So what do you think the implications are of this? So now what we see is this. When you have a corpus callosum, callosum severed, you have the ability now to have two independent brains and one skull. Each brain has access only to certain information and it can now, no longer share what it knows. The right brain can no longer share what it knows to the left brain because there's no internal methodology for that to be accomplished. That results in this. This is the split visual field. So you sit somebody down, you tell them to look maybe at a, a cross or something in the middle of the screen. And then you flash the pictures that you see here. One is going to the, uh, one in the left visual field is gonna to go to the right brain. That's the pencil, goes to the right brain. The one in the right visual field is gonna to go to the left brain, okay? So basically now, if the corpus callosum has been severed, the right brain does not know what the left brain knows at all. So each hemisphere perceives the half of the view in front of, fr front of you that goes with the half of the body that's connected by that hemisphere. So here, red with red, blue with blue. That's the way that works, okay? So if you asked this person, this split brain person here, if you asked them, Hey, what do you see on the screen? Can somebody tell me what they would say? You can, you can type it in if you want. What will they say? If we ask this person what they see on the screen, what will, they, what will be their response? Anyone? Remember, only one of these brains here, one of these hemispheres, has enough language capability to say anything loud, to control your speaking. So if that's indeed the case, what did the left brain see? Okay, exactly. The left side brain will be able to speak. Therefore, they will say they saw an apple, exactly. And then they'll ask them, well, what is on the other? Did you see something else? And they will say, no, didn't see it. Keep asking. You can keep asking them until the cows come home. They'll still say they only saw an apple because believe it or not, the, one, the brain that's speaking to you now, that's all they saw was an apple. Now, how can you tell them what was in, what is currently in their right brain, the brain that cannot speak? What you would have to do is give that person, the split brain person, a, a marker and put that marker in their left hand and tell them to draw what they saw. So you put the marker in their left hand and the left hand is controlled by, guess what? The right brain. And guess who saw the thing in the left visual field? The right brain. So the right brain has the information and put it in a marker in their left hand, they'll draw it out. And then the left brain can see it and say pencil. Now what that would demonstrate is that you see communication happening outside the body. 
That's what that demonstrates. It's happening outside the body. Because internal communication between the left and right hemisphere no longer exists. Now, these can be some really odd things that occur because left brain and right brain no longer communicate with each other. You can literally find somebody doing something that the other brain was not aware that they were doing because they're not in constant communication with each other. A couple more slides here. Then let's look at the divided brain in action. People are able to follow two instructions and draw two different shapes simultaneously. Divided brain people can do that because to them, both brains are getting, both brains are getting the instructions and there's no interference. Now, if we were given the same task with our corpus callosum intact, we could never be really good at it at all because the interference that will occur between both instructions would be intensified because our left and right hemisphere are always basically battling each other and confusing the situation. But with a split brain individual, they sit down, they get both pencils, they get the instructions flashed to both their brain and they do it no problem but we have problems doing that. Now, there's a drawback, okay? That may be a, a nifty tool, but consider the ramifications and implications of having two independent brains, in a sense, in one skull. People can become, they can become extremely frustrated that the right and left sides do different things. Think about it. What if you found out all of a sudden that you're, you're in some sort of meeting and you found out that your left hand is picking your nose, okay? So the idea here is that, again, we'll see that there can be some really weird things that can happen when you're not com being communicated with and your brains are not totally in sync uh, with one another. So people with divided brains may be more likely to report frustration with the left hand is doing or right hand is doing simply because they're not always going to be fully aware. At least the verbal one is not always going to be aware of that. Okay. Are there any questions or comments before we move on to the last little bit here? Uh, I have a question. Let me read it real quickly. Uh, Off the top of my head, I'm not familiar with that. I can't grab it in my mind right now. I'll look into it. Uh, someone asked, is this the same as the studies where participants are asked to draw a picture and they can only draw half of it? Uh, I'll have to look to see if that's the same thing. I'm not quite sure off the top of my head here. Okay, so what we have now is we have understanding about split brain nature okay and some of the things that pop up as because of it now we have these two hemispheres okay lateralization going to one side lateralization is the idea of the two hemispheres uh the two hemispheres serve some different functions how do we know about these differences well we know about these differences uh, as i have alluded to earlier uh because the brain damage studies revealed many functions of the left hemisphere again we have brain damage and we are able to either identify the brain damage uh, through some sort of a non-invasive means or after the person has died and do, through autopsy, be able to localize it. We've been able to sort of pinpoint where certain things may happen and what functions uh, they may serve. And so that way we were able to build ideas and models in our mind as to where certain functionalities may occur. Brain scans and split brain studies show more about the functions of the two hemispheres and they coordinate with each other. Uh, again, I think uh, this semester too, I have uh, uh, the split brain video available to you and it does show you some really amazing things that they've done some research on uh, to determine where certain functionalities may tend to reside either in the left or right hemisphere. Uh, and, and so if you didn't get a chance to see that, please do. Uh, I, I think it should be entertaining as well as very enlightening and educational. Uh, brain scan studies show normal individuals engage their right brain when completing a perceptual task and their left brain when carrying out a linguistic task. However, many functions of the two hemispheres do indeed 
uh, overlap. So we can't always say it's going to be one way or the other way. Again, uh, we know, for example, people who are born uh, with uh, no ability to process visual information, uh, that basically means their occipital lobe, which is there to process visual information, is not then utilized. It's not unheard of for that part of the brain to find a, quote, job doing something else, helping to process some other type of information. Again, that points to uh, the idea of plasticity nature of the brain uh, as well. All right. Are there any questions before we uh, wrap things up for today? We still have a couple more things to do, but are there any questions about any of this? Okay. All right. Since there are no questions, let's go ahead and do a couple of more housekeeping things real quickly here. All right. So this is a little bit of an announcement. I thought we would be ending early today, and we looks like we will. All right. So remember the following. There is a review session on Canvas that I was found that is legitimate for you guys and relevant to you guys as well. I have made sure that's now posted on your Canvas site, and that's what the middle blue arrow is pointing to, review session unit number one. It sort of does a really 35 or 40 minute summary of all the main key ideas that we've talked about so far in this first unit of the course. All right. Also want to point out too that this is uh, tomorrow. Your is it tomorrow? What's today? Thursday. Tomorrow, I believe your exam will become live uh, and be available to you. Uh, and you need to complete that exam by February fifteenth by eleven fifty nine p.m. So I think that's going to be Monday by eleven fifty nine p.m. So uh, you have. Uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and all day Monday to, to get her done. And that would be your unit one exam. I had a few uh, emails, I believe, and questions about the current event paper as well. Uh, I think we did cover that in a previous session, uh, some of the logistics of it. And again, if you have any questions, you can ask it, but please, there are several sources already available to you. Uh, please look at them to make sure that uh, you're not asking a question that has already sort of been addressed. But again, if you have to ask me, that's fine too. Uh, the other thing about the current event paper is when is it due? Uh, currently, it's slated for uh, the fourth unit. Okay, so unit four is some time away. So we're looking at April, and I think it's April 11th by 11.59 p.m. is when it's due. This is not to say you can do it, you can do it earlier. In fact, it's not a really intense paper at all. Uh, remember, it's not asking for a lot, but if you do have something that you're really interested in, you can go ahead and do it and go ahead and submit it early. That's fine too. Uh, but again, the final due date for it is April 11th uh, by 11 to 9 p.m. Okay, are there any questions? All right, uh, once we open the exam, it must be completed at the time frame. Correct, that is correct, and thank you for mentioning that. Uh, this exam uh, is once open, you need to finish it. It's unlike your chapter quiz homeworks where you can uh, stop, save, uh, and then submit it later. So there is, I think for you guys, I think it's 90 minutes, and I'll see uh, before I open it again if there's any uh, special conditions for anyone else here that may get some additional time, but usually 90 minutes is usually more than sufficient uh, for the exams I've seen with most classes. Okay, uh, is there a special browser required? Yeah, you will be able to open it from Canvas. It is part of the Canvas system, so you'll click on the link and it will open for you. Okay, all right. Is there any other questions or comments? All right, it is 2.17 by my clock, so you guys have, uh, well, 2.18 now. You guys have a few minutes to get into trouble. Don't get in too much trouble on my dime. All right, thanks for attending today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please email me. Uh, and I'll talk to you guys later. And don't forget your assignments uh, for the unit exam uh, due by February 15th. And then you can keep working on those topics and ideas for your current event paper. All right, I'll see you guys later. Bye.